almost afternoon. So good to have you. If you're joining us online, welcome to Vineyard Church, Vineyard Church Online. We're starting a series uh, that we're going to be going through over the next six weeks on running with the giants. Run, the giants are the some of these giants of faith, some really heroes. And we looked at Hebrews 11, it kind of lists a lot of the heroes. We're going to pick some of them and we're going to you know, there's a lot we can learn from them, so we're going we're gonna to grow and, uh, and develop from that. So we're going to kick it off with a great hero of the faith, which is Noah, Noah and the, and the ark, right? I mean, if you, most of us are familiar with that. Certainly, if you went to Sunday school, you're familiar with, with Noah and the ark and the animals and the flood, and so we're going to look at that a little bit. But you know, um, there was about a million people, scientists say, that were alive at that time, Way back in the day, there was about a million people, and God only chose one, so he literally is one in a million, one in a million. Why did he choose? No, I want to look at that, kind of open up with that. Here we see in Hebrews, I said, Hebrews 11 is kind of the, the, the hall of fame of faith that we see, and he says, by faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, we'll come back to that in just a moment. In holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. So God chooses Noah. Have you ever wondered why did he choose Noah? If you are going to choose somebody today, if God said, okay, I want you to choose, you know, one person in their family, who would you choose? Well, would you choose yourself? <laughs> if you were God, would you say, hey, I think I'm... I'm a candidate to be the one person to keep, you know, the human race going. Well, maybe you have a good self-esteem. I don't know. But uh, th there's actually reasons we see why God chose Noah. And if God's going to use you, he, it's going to be some of the same reasons. Look at what the Bible says here about how God chooses people. He says, for the eyes of the Lord search back and forth across the whole earth, looking for people whose hearts. That's a key word. That when God's choosing people, he looks on the inside of us. There's a spiritual domain that the Bible refers to as our heart. Not the physical pump, but the actual, there's a, there's a soul, there's, a, there's, there's thoughts, there's all kinds of stuff going on. Are perfect toward him so that he can show his great power in helping them. That's how we get God's help. That's how we move forward with God. So I want to look at that four characteristics of Noah's heart that really we need uh, in our lives. Now, if you have your Bibles, open them up to Genesis chapter 6, because we're going to be unpacking that a little bit. The, the story of Noah and the flood really covers four chapters, 6, 7, 8, 9. Genesis is the first book in the Bible. If you have your Bible app, you can open that up as well. So we're going to be going through this, and we're going to begin with Genesis uh, chapter 6, verse 5. He says, The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of his thoughts in his heart, there it is again, thoughts in his heart was only evil all the time. And so the actions, people's actions follow what's going on inside of them, their heart. And he says that there was evil going on in there. It says the Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. So the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I have created from the face of the earth, men and animals, creatures that move along the ground, and birds in the air. So the whole, the whole group, not just people. He says, for I am grieved that I have made them, but Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So one, God has favor with, for one person, one guy. And uh, let's look at the characteristics of Noah and why he chose him. First of all, and it might seem obvious, is that Noah was available. Now, not everybody's available. You'd almost think that would be the easiest thing. Like, God will use me if I'm available. Because we tend to gravitate towards, like, you know, having great abilities. You know, God's looking for superstars. He's looking for great athletes. He's looking for incredible celebrities. Because if just one of those gets serious with God and starts talking about God and living for God, then look at what God can do. But actually, that's not at all what God looks for. He looks for availability. That's a characteristic of the heart. God, I'm available. Often, you know, we're ordinary people. We're average people. This church is filled with ordinary and average people. I don't know if, if you knew that. 
So if you're part of this church, you're ordinary. You're probably you're, you're average, most likely, right? You're going, Andy, are you insulting me? Well, I'm part of the church, man. I mean, this is we're a church filled with ordinary, and that's how what Jesus likes to use is ordinary and average people. Look at the disciples. You look at them. You go, those guys were kind of losers. You know, like what did they really have going for them? Whenever he shows up. And they're like, the, 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 the fishermen are like always mending their nets. They can't even afford like good nets. They're always like repairing them. Jesus uses people that are available. Number two is you got to be willing to be different. Especially in a culture that is not in sync with what God wants. I mean, there's the more pressure, and some cultures are, 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 are more like, you know, are more evil than others. Some cultures are more corrupt than others. There's, there, there, that's why revivals have come in the past where the culture can become so corrupt, all of a sudden revival breaks out and kind of shifts it back more centered. Like, hey, people are more looking for God's move in their lives. But that, unfortunately, there was no revival at that moment. God's bringing revival through the flood, really. He says, this is the account of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among people of his time, and he walked with God. So Noah is a man of deep conviction. Not only is he available, he's not a superstar, didn't say that. He's available, but he also has deep conviction. He's not, he's not afraid to stand alone, to stand out from the crowd. He's not taking uh, opinion polls. He's not running for a popularity contest. You, the problem is the culture was evil. There was corruption, there was violence, there was immorality. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. And so if you let the society influence you, it's going to lead you away. Now in America, we have a high premium on the majority is right. Right? The majority is right. Our laws are kind of rooted in that. The majority goes into the legislature, and then they make the rules. I mean, the majority, but the problem is often the majority is wrong. And so even though that's a high ideal in America, that can, that can if, we, if we buy into that, we end up on the wrong side. So no, here's something that no one knew. One plus God is the majority that you need. If, you're, if, you, if most of us would like to be on the, you know, on the majority, well, as long as you're doing what God wants, you've got the majority. And now, certainly Noah received plenty of criticism from people, ridicule from neighbors. Look at that old kook. What's he doing, building some stupid boat? He, I'm sure he had pressure from his family, his kids probably at school. You know, what's your dad do? Well, he builds boats. He builds a huge boat in our yard. That's it. Yep, that's it. He was probably misunderstood. He was criticized. And in Christianity, that's going to happen all of the time because we have our marching orders from God's Word. We read the Bible. And God says that's, that's timeless. That's where we root our morals into. That's where we root our behavior. We're trying to align our heart with the heart of God. That will be different than the world. Jesus said that to be a follower of his, he says that, he goes, Jesus says, the world hates me. He goes, if you're following me, the world's going to dislike you. It's going to hate you. And if we're not careful, it will cause us to veer off. In fact, the fear of man is a dangerous trap, but to trust God means safety. And so not looking at the crowd, being a person of conviction. Noah, we just looked at that verse was somebody who walked with God. That's how he was rooted. That's how he got that characteristic in his life of daring to be different. He didn't have to get his cues from people around him that, okay, I feel, I feel better now about myself because other people are happy with me. Other people agree with me. If you, do, if you allow that, you'll end up not serving the Lord. So be available, dare to be different, then follow God completely committing to God's plan. Now, sometimes, you know, God's plan doesn't even make sense. But you do it wholeheartedly. You say, God, I'm all in. Two different places in, in, in the story of Noah talks about this. It says Noah did everything just as God commanded in, in chapter 6 and then in chapter 7. And Noah did all that the Lord 
had commanded him to do. So sometimes there's this element of just, I'm just going to follow God. I grew up in Arizona, went, and then I came to Christ, and the church I was in was in, involved in church planting, so I, I, uh, I studied, went through an apprentice program. I was all ready to stay in Arizona and, and, and launch a church there, and I felt very clearly that God wanted me to come to Virginia and get a master's degree in Christian leadership or Christian ministry. And, uh, and that was like, I, I, didn't want, I didn't like school. See, people that like school, they go, whoa, that's so awesome. Well, for me, I'm, I hated school. I wasn't good at it. I didn't like it. It was a struggle for me. So when I got my bachelor's degree, I was like, man, I am so done. And all of a sudden, I feel God calling me to come out here and get a master's degree. So when I come out uh, at Regent University, so I come out, and I'm thinking one year. I'm, I'm in, I'm out, I'm going back to where I was supposed to be. Well, I, I had a job in Arizona working at Costco. And so I came here and transferred, so I had a job when I came. And uh, I'm driving the forklift one day. This is towards after I've been here almost a year, and I'm about to graduate. I've got my paperwork in, and I feel like the Lord speaks to me while I'm driving the forklift. And, he, and I felt like the Lord said, I want you to get a Master of Divinity, which is a three-year graduate degree. And I'm thinking, you, you tricked me. I, you could have told me that back in Tucson, and then I would have said no, you know. You know but, but I come out here. So I, but I'm thinking, because I had to pay for it all. And so I said, well, God, I need you. I'll do it, but I need you to pay for it. I can't get into a bunch of debt. And so I felt like the Lord said, I will pay for it. I'll make sure it's all paid for. So I went and I talked to the dean. I said, hey, I'm, I feel like the Lord told me this. And he goes, well, I'll, I'll waive 75% of your tuition and all your expenses from this point forward. I, that was pretty good. I felt like, praise, but that wasn't the whole deal. I went back to the Lord and prayer. I said, God, you're supposed, I, we had a deal 100%. Well, right around that time, uh, Costco was starting to come out with the scholarship. And uh, so I applied for it and I got it. It was 25, it covered the other 25%, but only for a year. So I did that, and then, and then uh, the next year, I, I said, hey, can I reapply for this? They go, well, we're trying to, you know, we don't want the same person getting that. There's only like two of them for the whole, for the whole chain. They said, but I said, well, is it okay? Can I do it? They said, yeah, you can do it, but don't get your hopes up. So I reapplied for a second year. I got it again. I was the only person to get it twice, up until that point at least. And so, it covered, so I mean, I didn't know all of that. I'm just saying yes and God then does his part. It doesn't always make sense. I'm, I ended up here in Virginia. And, I, and you know what? I'm glad I'm, I'm glad I'm here. You know, I mean, <laughs> God told me to start a church. And so it's, it wasn't a church in Arizona. It was a church in Virginia Beach. And, uh, and, and I felt like the Lord told me to marry Sharon. Now, that actually didn't take a lot of faith because she was the most gorgeous woman on the planet and the smartest woman. So I, I don't get... I don't get any credit for that just because it was, it was a no-brainer. She was amazing. But taking one step after another, God, yes, God, yes, God, yes. I, I, I want to do what you're calling me to do. That's what Noah did. In those days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving their children to be married until the day Noah entered the boat. So just as Jesus talking, he's saying they were caught off guard. It says they knew nothing about what was happening until the flood came and destroyed them. There's this element of surprise. Noah didn't understand how was, he had never seen a rainbow before. The Bible says it had not rained up until that time that there was the water was uh, the the earth was watered through some kind of mist. And so that's why it was a surprise when they saw the rainbow. Wow, look, and that's the, that was the covenant, the rainbow. Then also the, all the animals, how is he going to get all the animals together? Right? I mean, well, the Bible says actually God brought the animals. Well, how did that happen? Who knows, right? I mean, we do know that when, animal, when there's like an impending uh, catastrophe, like, for example, in 2004 in the Indian Ocean, the earthquake and the tsunami that killed almost a quarter of a million people all the way in, from Asia all the way down to Africa, do you know almost no animals died in that? Because not moments before, days before, animals, reptiles, mammals, 
amphibians all sensed something was happening going down, and they all went to higher ground. Now, I think it's kind of odd that, I mean, if you were a person in that situation, you saw all these animals, you know, your, your, your little rover, little, hey, rover, and he's like, you know, they're all heading to high ground. You'd think you'd get a clue, right? They don't. And there, I told you about 2004, but if you research it on your own, which I did this past week, there's many large uh, catastrophes where animals started going months in advance. Scientists don't understand it. If it happens like a few moments, like, you know, like an hour or two, then they think, oh, there must have been vibrations. How, how are you going to know weeks and months in advance? Well, no, animals, are, I guess they have that, that ability. I think that might have been part of what was going on with Noah. They probably sensed there's something impending, and they come, but he still has to divide them up, right? He still has got to, okay, don't put the bobcat next to the rabbit. That's, you know, I mean, he's got all these, these challenges that, that, that come along with it. But I need to follow God's plan. Follow God's plan for me, even when it doesn't make sense. Even when it causes problems at work. Even when it causes problems in my home. Look at what Jesus said. He, I mean, he, he doesn't mince any words. He says, anyone who wants to be my follower must love me far more than he does his own father, mother, wife, children, brothers, and sisters. Yes, more than his own life. Otherwise, he can't be my disciple. So that's Jesus' call. He says, when you put God first, now the good news is when we put God first, he blesses all these other relationships, all these other things. It is the pathway to freedom and blessing, but it does take this where I'm, I'm going to put God first in my life. He's most important. The Lord says, now let's settle the matter. You are stained red with sin. So he's saying that there's, it's, there's a problem. Why we need Christ, because we're not close to God. Outside of Christ, there's this barrier called sin. He says, you're stained with it, but I will wash you as clean as snow if you will only obey me. So there's this aspect of saying, God, I want to follow you. I want to follow, I want to put you first. Now, we like to use uh, an, an acronym to describe these first three characteristics I just told you about, which is, we, we refer to it around here as being fat. Being fat, and fat's a good thing, okay? Uh, fat standing for, are you faithful? Are you available? Are you teachable? That's really what we just talked about. Are you faithful? Are you available? Are you teachable? So we want you, here at Vineyard, we want you to be fat, okay? So, of course, there's some context with that, so be careful. And then number four is never give up. Now, we're going to look at Moses, who is one of the heroes we're going to look at. He had to wait 80 years to deliver the people out of, out of Egypt, out of slavery. Noah, though, waited 120 years, building the ark. It talks about it here. It says, then the Lord said, my spirit will not contend with man forever. In other words, his patience has a limit. He says, for he is mortal, his days will be 100 and 20 years. He's talking about Noah taking 120 years in order to build this ark. Now, it's, that's endurance, right? That's perseverance. That's sticking in there. Wouldn't you agree, though, that it's one thing to hang in there. It's another thing to be enthusiastic the whole time. I mean, it probably would have been tough for Noah to come home. Mrs. Noah says, hey, how'd work go? Same old, same old. You know, cutting the wood, dragging it down, you know, putting the angles in and nailing and tarring and all the things that go into that. Just, but to stay enthusiastic, that's a whole nother, a whole nother part. Now, the, you, I think we get points for just doing it, right? There's, there's, there's something to be said with that. Just kind of one foot instead of the other. But ultimately what God wants us to do is be enthusiastic, the whole time, that's part of perseverance. The temptations to give up, I listed three. One is his problems. We can start to doubt ourselves when problems come. But here, every possibility comes with a problem. You know, God's plan for your life includes problems. I don't know if you knew that. It includes problems. If you're using problems to, uh, as the, as the uh, indicator of am I serving, am I doing God's plan, you're going to be all messed up. 
Because there's a lot of problems with God's plan. Sometimes people go, oh, yeah, well, you know, I'm not feeling blessed. I have too many problems in my life. It must be an indication that God's not part of this. That's not, that's not, I mean, it might, might not be what God, God might want you to change. But you can't use problems as the measurement. Look at how many problems Noah had. Could you imagine the amount of problems he had doing this? And he had his family helping him a little bit. But as I said, he's separating the animals, trying to, you know, keep them from eating each other. He's got to provide all this food. What about the sanitation problems? Yeah, I don't think they all hibernated back then. You know, nobody knows. The scientists don't know where hibernation came in. They, Christian scientists think maybe that's when, you know, that's a good time to, to inject hibernation into everything. You know, your sanitation, all the poop, all of the smells. Your only option is to drown outside. You're that, you know, and yet he was directly in the center of God's will. So be careful. Don't let problems be your indication of whether this is God or not. Pressure is another one. We have all kinds of pressures that we have. Noah would have had the pressure. Of, what about all the responsibility? Hey, Noah, I hope you get this right. Here's some directions on how to build the boat. If you didn't build it right after the flood, I mean, that's, there's a lot of pressure, right? I'm, it's my job to restart the entire human race. That's pressure. And yet, that could be a temptation to quit. And then also people. People disappoint us. People let us down. People hurt us. And we can get into a funk where we're just looking for the exit. How do you get through these kinds of temptations, of problems, of pressures of people. Well, that's why we have small groups. Small groups is a key part of how we how we work through this. How you can stay above, you know, the the pressures and the temptations to quit. You know, you can actually drink a cup of arsenic and not die if it's diluted with enough water. And sometimes some of you are drinking arsenic. I mean, you've got it at work, at your home, and different relationships. You just It's poisoning you, and you're thinking, I don't know how long I can live. You need to dilute that. You need other people who are championing you, who are speaking life into you, who are praying for you, who are encouraging you and lifting you up. We all need that.
lived on. What happened to his spirit? Well, here's what it says. This is Jesus' the spirit. And it was in the spirit that he visited the spirits of prison and preached to them. Spirits of those who long before in the days of Noah had refused to listen to God. That's, that's where Jesus, that's what he was doing. Preaching. Noah preached every day. Not necessarily with a pulpit. Not with a TV. Noah's preaching was showing up faithfully at work. And building a boat. Even though nobody even knew what it was about. A boat? What's that? I mean, nobody had seen rain before. He said, well, what's that for? A flood? What's a flood? Closest body of water was the Mediterranean, 500 miles away. I mean, it made no sense. So he's preaching the gospel because he is not letting the culture dictate what, how he's going to live his life. Going on, continuing. Though he waited patiently for them while Noah was building the ark. Talking about the people Jesus preached to. Yet only eight persons were saved from the drowning in that terrible flood. That, by the way, is what baptism pictures for us. So now he's making the connection. He's saying we get baptized. And that also is a picture of the ark. He says in baptism we show that we have been saved from death and doom by the resurrection of Christ. Not because our bodies are washed clean by the water. That's not what baptism is about. It's a heart. Like we started, it's all about God looking at the heart. He says, but because in being baptized, we are turning to God and asking him to cleanse our hearts from sin. And now Christ is in heaven, sitting in the place of honor next to God the Father with all the angels and powers of heaven bowing before him and obeying him. God used Noah because his heart was surrendered to God. His heart was right before God. God can use you. Maybe you have been using your lack of ability as an excuse for God saying, I want availability. Maybe this area where, you know, daring to be different. You know, hey, God, that's not the way I'm wired. I, you know, I, I, I am afraid of people. I do want to get accepted. You know, that's a real thing. That's why you bring that to God. Say, God, help me to have to boldly stand for you. Well, Paul prayed for that often. He prayed for that for himself. He prayed for that for others in the New Testament. When we have fears, when we have insecurities. God, help me to stand for you. God chooses to use ordinary people, average people, that make themselves available to Him. They say, God, use me. Let's bow our heads and we'll pray.
everything else in this world. Because when we align ourselves up with God that way, it becomes the avenue for all of God's blessings. Wherever you want God to bless your life, God, I haven't really surrendered everything. Some areas in my life, areas in my sexuality, areas in my finances, areas in my business dealings, areas in my marriage, or with my boyfriend or my girlfriend. God's putting his finger on that. The Holy Spirit does that. That's not about me. I'm not saying it. Right now, I want you to surrender that area because I want to bless it, and I can't surrender. I'm going to invite you if you would to pray a prayer with me with every head bowed, every eye closed. This is your moment to be honest with God, to be authentic and to surrender. This isn't about joining Vineyard Church. This is about you getting right with God. You fully surrendering. And I'm going to invite you to pray a prayer with me. A prayer of total surrender total surrender I'm not going to embarrass you and have you stand up or come forward but I do want to know who I'm praying for so if that's you and you're saying Andy I'm ready I want to pray that prayer of surrender I want God's full blessing in my life then I want you to let me know just boldly right where you're at just raise your hand just put your hand up bless you yep and come on, there's some more of you. This is your moment. Bless you. Okay, I see you in the back. Yep. Anybody else? Keep your hand up just for a second. Okay, there's a number of you. Okay, you can put your hands down. You join me as well if you're online. and That was your heart's cry. Pray this prayer, would you? Say, today is my day. Today is my day. I surrender to you fully. God, I want to give you myself. I want your blessing. Would you say, God, I need your help. Cleanse my heart. Cleanse my heart, God. Help me, Lord, to be more available to you, to be willing to stand out for you, and to follow you me with enthusiasm and going about walking out this life with you. Would you say, Holy Spirit, come help me in this journey. Give me a fresh start. In Jesus' name.